Please be seated. Back on the record, case number 19, CR 586 A and B, State of Ohio versus Daniel Groves, and State of Ohio versus Jessica Groves. Counsel and the parties and all jurors and alternate jurors are present in the courtroom. The state and the defense have rested their cases. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've now heard the evidence that you will consider in deciding this matter. The lawyers will now have an opportunity to provide to you a closing argument to summarize the evidence and the law in this matter. Is the state prepared for closing argument? Yes, Your Honor. Is the defendant Daniel Groves prepared for closing argument? We are at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. Is the defendant Jessica Groves prepared for closing argument? Yes, we are, Your Honor. State of Ohio, Ms. Hutchinson? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Hutchinson, you may address the jury. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, opposing counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good afternoon. At this point, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is that your service here as jurors is almost complete. The bad news is that the most difficult part of your service is about to begin, and that is your deliberations. His Honor, Judge Kuhn will instruct you as to the exact law that you are to follow and what applies in this case, but I'd like to take a few minutes just to assist you in understanding what it is we believe we need to prove here, what we have proved, and how that relates to the charges. We discussed at the beginning of the week, as to all charges, the defendants are equally charged and can be found guilty as the principal offender or by acting in complicity. In other words, if you find that either of these two defendants aided or abetted the other, each defendant is guilty. His Honor will instruct you that aided and abetted means supported, assisted, encouraged, incited, cooperated with, advised. His Honor will further instruct you that complicity includes conspiring with one another to commit offenses. Again, if something I say differs from something Your Honor says, you are to follow his instructions. So let's talk about the charges and the evidence that you've heard this week. Count one again is aggravated murder. The state of Ohio must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendants did or were complicit to purposely. I'm going to go through some of these individually. Purposely, I submit to you ladies and gentlemen of the jury that multiple rib fractures are purposeful injuries. Those aren't accidental. I submit to you that multiple skull fractures that happened at different times and even at a time different than the rib fractures are purposeful. I submit to you that the multiple complete arm fractures and leg fractures are purposeful. Calls the death of baby Dylan. Can I say what mechanism was used to cause baby Dylan's injuries? No. And you heard defendant Jessica Gross, she can't remember what happened. I submit to you ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you are the finders of fact. You go back to the jury room and you determine what happened here. What you heard from the witness stand and you'll be instructed by his honor that you are only to consider evidence that came from that witness stand in the form of testimony or exhibits. Nothing I said, nothing they said, the lawyers, we're not testifying. Only what comes from that witness stand. What did you hear from Dr. Brown? Dr. Brown testified that there was actual evidence of homicidal violence. 
that caused baby Dylan's death. All those fractures we just talked about. She testified she couldn't rule in or rule out drowning. Jessica Groves can't remember. Did failure to seek medical, emergency medical care after multiple serious injuries over a period of time cause baby Dylan's death? She can't remember. And he did nothing. And the last element is that that baby, baby Dylan, was under 13 years of age at the time of this offense. Well, there's no dispute, because today he would be one if we weren't here discussing his aggravated murder. Count two murder requires the state of Ohio to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that these two defendants did or were complicit in knowingly. His honor will instruct you that a person acts knowingly regardless of their purpose when they're aware that their conduct will create a certain result. Are you aware that three violent incidents is probably going to result in a baby's death? Daniel Groves doesn't see anything wrong with bashing a baby in the head four times or picking it up and squeezing it and shaking it. You can do that to a baby? He watched this happen to his own son, baby Dylan. He says by his own wife. The man that Children's Services placed this baby's safety upon did nothing. That's not complicity. You let her around that baby one more day after you saw that and you're not complicit to this whole thing? Would she have had any other access to this baby but for defendant Daniel Groves? Again, count two murder knowingly caused the death of baby Dylan as a proximate result of committing or attempting to commit an offense of violence that is a felony of the first or second degree, felonious assault, over and over and over. Count three, kidnapping, requires us to prove that these defendants in this case Again, baby Dylan was under 13, so by any means, any means, did they remove baby Dylan from the place where he was found or restrain his liberty for the purpose of hindering, impeding, or obstructing a governmental function? I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that every single time these two defendants withheld baby Dylan from children's services, they committed a kidnapping. You heard the testimony. The initial plan involved children's services seeing face-to-face -face baby Dylan weekly. At some point, maybe that went to monthly. You all determine that. And you also heard the children's services worker say that at any time if they requested to see this baby, these defendants were to submit to that request. Whether children's services filed or asked ch criminal charges to be filed on each of those occasions is not an issue here because you're the finders of fact. You go back there and determine whether or not they violated the law. I submit to you they did. Between February 4th and February 25th, Children's Services caseworker testified there were numerous attempts to contact these defendants about baby Dylan, such that they ended up going to Daniel Jr.'s school to try to pass messages to his parents. And again, from that visit on February 25th to March 28th, numerous attempts to make contact. After March 28th to June, when baby Dylan's body was recovered, numerous attempts to make contact 
by children's services, by law enforcement, by juvenile court. Count four, endangering children. As a parent, guardian, custodian, person having custody or control in loco parentis of a child under the age of 18. These defendants at the time, the testimony was, were not the custodians. Children's services were the custodians. But they were certainly the parents, and they were certainly the people in control. Therefore, they had a duty to prevent substantial risks of health and safety to baby Dylan. And they violated that duty of care, protection, and it resulted in serious physical harm, actually death, so more than serious physical harm. Did either of these defendants tell you that they made one emergency phone call to help that baby? Could he have survived his injuries? I don't know. He wasn't given a chance. Did Daniel Groves create a substantial risk to the health or safety of baby Dylan, therefore violating his duty? His duty. Children's Services made that his duty to take care of and protect baby Dylan from serious physical harm and death by allowing her to come right back around after she bashed him in the face four times and squeezed him by the rib cage? He was foolishly unaware, they say. Count six, interference with custody. Did they know they didn't have the privilege to do what they were doing? Or were they reckless in that regard? Did they keep or harbor baby Dylan from the custodian, from children's services? And did that result in harm to baby, physical harm to baby Dylan? Count seven, gross abuse of a corpse. Treating baby Dylan's body in a way that would outrage reasonable community sensibilities. These defendants dumped him in a dark 30-foot well of water and left him there for months. And I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that had Detective Conkle not had the training and experience to put them in a room together and listen to what they were saying, we would have never found baby Dylan's body. You listen to the whispering. If they find his body, we're effed. Felonious assault, knowingly causing serious physical harm to baby Dylan. Four counts. Rib fractures. Significant calcification, two-inch skull fracture, some healing, not as much as the rib fractures. One-inch skull fracture, complete upper arm fracture, complete lower leg fracture, large chest contusion, swelling to his abdomen, Those are all separate counts because they're all separate injuries. There was nothing that came out of that witness stand that explained that how those injuries could have all happened at one time. So you have multiple counts to consider. You are also the judges of credibility. The sole judges of credibility and his honor will instruct you that you are. So you determine who sits on that witness stand and who's telling the truth. 
Whether you believe some of it, all of it, none of it, you determine that. So let's talk about reasons why you may or may not believe Defendant Daniel Groves. First, it was that Children's Services took the baby. Then, it was that he just found baby Dylan dead. Nobody killed him. Next, he told <coughs> Daniel Jr. the dream catcher hurt the baby. Then, in a jail visit, he tells a female he didn't kill him or dump his body. He didn't have anything to do with any of this. And yet another version that we heard in here this morning was that he watched his wife strike that child in the head four times and snatch him up by the ribs. You all go back there and decide what's, what's truth and what's not. If you believe that he wasn't the principal, then discuss whether or not he was complicit. And we talked about some of that, about children's services placing the baby with this defendant. Why else would you collect the urine of your 15-year-old son? Put it in a small bottle with a lid on it. For his buddy? So had there been an actual urine test, maybe he wouldn't have even had placement. <clears throat> Sounds like he facilitated this whole thing from the word go. He was foolishly unaware. That's what was said in opening statements, foolishly unaware. They want you to believe that these two defendants wouldn't scheme up a way to tamper with urine. These two defendants who wrapped that baby boy in six layers of plastic and duct tape and chained his body inside a milk crate, loaded it on a four-wheeler, and drove it and dumped it in a well. But they wouldn't tamper with urine specimens. How is he complicit? Who was it that Children's Services was having all that contact with? She testified it was Daniel Groves, that he had four different phone numbers she was trying to communicate with. How is he complicit? He was foolishly unaware that his wife was pregnant for so long, yet their 15-year-old son knew and confronted her. He was foolishly unaware that she was getting so high, yet everybody at the hospital recognized it. He was foolishly unaware that she was not going to the Mahajan appointment. Why not rat her out for all this? Could it be because he's high right along with her? You heard Detective Conkle testify that he's dope sick rolling around the interrogation room. Foolishly unaware that baby Dylan was injured so seriously. You've seen the pictures. You heard that 15-year-old little boy describe that baby as having bruising all around where his hair would be expected. How would he describe that picture from the autopsy if that wasn't the way that baby looked? But defendant Daniel Groves didn't know
And Daniel Jr. said it was a matter of time after he sees this that the baby disappeared. He didn't know. He couldn't have called right then for emergency medical assistance to give baby Dylan a chance to survive. I submit to you that's the least he could have done. You're expected to believe that these parents, who everyone from the hospital testified, never asked questions about that baby when he was removed and couldn't breathe, stayed glued to each other, and then packaged up their baby and threw him in a 30-foot well, were suddenly so caring that they wanted to hold baby Dylan every time Patricia Kraft was there. Do you suppose that's so she wouldn't touch him and figure out he had injuries? You heard the phone call with her sister. Together, for better or worse, till death do us part. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that's the way it's been from the time that baby was born to right here this week. Against their own children. You were told at the beginning of this, Jessica Groves is going to take responsibility. Did she take responsibility when she spoke with Detective Conkle? She take responsibility when she spoke to her sister? Did she take responsibility in here this morning when she spoke to you? She can't remember what happened, but she does remember it was an accident. Is that taking responsibility for these injuries? You're expected to believe Defendant Daniel Groves, everything he said in here. The same guy who, after they say the baby was dead, tells Children's Services in a text message he's growing like a weed. You were told that Daniel Groves panicked and dumped baby Dylan in a 30-foot well. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, does this look like panic to you? Does it? A chain, three padlocks, 12 zip ties, eight wire ties, 18 rocks, six layers of plastic and duct tape. Does this look like panic? I submit to you it looks like extreme planning. They want you to believe they're not complicit to their baby's murder. But this, this is what they chose for a coffin and his burial? This? And then they dumped him in a well. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Guilty on each and every count. Each one of them. Thank you, Ms. Hutchinson.